real life a very good evening everyone welcome to i focus online episode 310 uh, back to basics module number 1 today we have with us our very own dr kostumale sir from center for site hyderabad talking to us on essentials of ophthalmic pathology part 1 Sir has done his MBBS from Kims Karat and MD Pathology and Senior Residency in Anatomical uh, Pathology and Cytology from Apollo Hospitals Hyderabad. He then went on to do his Onco Pathology training from Bangalore uh, Institute of Oncology and Ophthalmic Pathology training from the prestigious L V Prasad Eye Institute Hyderabad. Currently, he heads the National Reporting Center for Ophthalmic Pathology at Center for Sight Hyderabad. He has several publications in peer review journal and many presentations and posters to his credit at both national and international level and the major awards and honors include Gangadhar Sundar gold medal award Dr S C Datta award at AIOS G Subalakshmi gold medal for young scientist and several other best paper awards at the AIOS and IAPM meetings also other than academics sir is a fitness enthusiast and is a tri triathlete who has raced his way uh, to the finish line at 6 70.3 Ironman events in Asia, Europe and Australia. I'm sure sir is going to give us some details about that too. We are lucky to have him as our teacher at Center for Sight and uh, lucky to have you here today uh, for this evening sir. Welcome and uh, over to you. Thank you Shefali. Uh good evening everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. So thank you sir for having me and Shefali again thank you for your kind introduction. uh so today we are going to get into some aspects of pathology uh which you as a clinician would need on a day to day basis not just to interpret report but also to guide your further management uh let me just share my screen okay uh visible yes sir okay uh since shefali has uh spoken about triathlons uh just to give a brief introduction i know this is not my topic for today but still you know i can't help uh so triathlon is basically you know a tri sport event as the name suggests three events uh the first is a swim event uh which runs from anywhere between 2 kilometers to 4 kilometers followed by a 90 to 180 kilometers bike ride and then of course is the run which is like either a half marathon or a full marathon now uh the association between a ophthalmologist and a pathologist is very pivotal uh to ensure that the histopathology report is accurate and intelligible enough so as to guide further and safe patient management at all stages it is very important that the communication between the two departments is clear either verbal or written preferably written so that there are no miscommunications there are no gaps uh, and every chain every link in the chain is important to ensure that the patient recovers with no harm now let us see you know what in day to day practice needs histopathology assessment any guesses ideally everything that is taken out needs to be sent to the pathology department but you know india india runs on a different note you know everything is guided here by economics and affordability so in case you know you you are caught in a dilemma whether to send not to send i'll just give you few examples of some specimens that you know you can you know i don't like saying this but still you know you can choose to not send i will not say put it in the dustbin but choose to not send so first among this is the first occurrence of a calesion in a patient less than 40 years old so this patient this specimen you know you may choose not to send it but if the patient is more than 40 years old it has to go now skin removed during blepharoplasty or other cosmetic procedures can also be ignored normal tissue removed during ectopion entropion surgeries or eyelid shortening can also be discarded fat excised for fat prolapse may also not be sent but everything else apart from this has to has to has to go to a pathology lab for further evaluation now that we have seen you know what needs to be assessed let's see how the specimen travels in the pathology department it goes through three it, uh, the journey is basically divided into three phases the first is a pre analytical phase analytical and post analytical phase 
a pre analytical phase includes any pre surgical communication between the two departments or the two personnel then the surgery itself the third is the report form or the communi written communication between the two departments the third is proper fixation and transport of the specimen then comes the analytical phase where you know there's a lot of tissue processing that goes around so we are not going to discuss this just because this is hardcore pathology and i have told myself not to discuss anything that is important that is less important to you now then you have the post analytical phase which includes what we histopathologists see and pen down in the form of a report then this report can be discussed in multidisciplinary meetings such as a tumor board meeting or in conferences so that's again a post analytical phase and even if you are, if you are not happy with the pathology report you can come and discuss it with me that's also a post analytical phase shefali does this a lot of times so and of course then you have a supplementary report sometimes a pathologist issues supplementary reports like report on uh, special stains immunohistochemistry or a um, report on bony structures deeper sections so this is these are all supplementary reports okay now what does a discussion between a ophthalmologist and a pathologist need to include and when should this discussion happen ideally apart from routine cases a discussion should be done on all special cases like you know sometimes there are frozen sections so if you feel that you know let's just say there's a margin which you feel is close close to the tumor than the others communicate it with the pathologist so that he will also be aware of what he needs to look into then there are certain tests or certain tissues certain diagnosis which need special fixators for example uh, let's say that's a there's a case of ocp that has to be sent in a special medium because it will lead immunofluorescence and by chance if you send it in formalin you will not get a diagnosis so to know which preservative to send in you let's discuss it with the pathologist then there are certain stains for example you are operating on a case of a sebaceous carcinoma and you need a diagnosis so there's a staining called oil redo staining which can be done only on fresh tissues once you once you put it in formalin the staining cannot be done so these are certain situations where a communication needs to happen between a surgeon and a ophthalmo uh, and a pathologist okay now this is a histopathology request form now ideally this is like a prescription or a request and it is a medical legal document so it has it, we need to ensure that it is properly filled now what does a what does a histopathological request form need to have general data about the patient demographic data the patient's name the mr number age and gender of course and some cases are linked to the occupation so if you can just add in the occupation also then comes the referral doctor why the referral doctors so that we know whom to communicate with and sometimes we might need some additional information we might need we might need to communicate certain diagnosis so in such situations we we need to know whom to communicate with the date and the, the date of surgery or the excision incision needs to be mentioned the nature of specimen whether it's a incision biopsy excision biopsy the location of the sample these are things that are very important also please mention brief clinical data i'm stressing brief please keep it brief what is pertinent and most important don't omit this because without this we cannot make a correct diagnosis if there are any previous surgeries that have been performed there is there is a availability of previous reports please enclose the reports to us so that we know what to look for what not to look for what has been done what has not been done and then we'll proceed accordingly okay now let's just say you have filled up the form how to send the specimen to the lab now ideally you should pack it in a container and fill it with a preservative wrap it up pack it such that you know the seal cannot be broken it won't it won't leak write the name of the patient the mr number and then send it across to the lab if there are sp specimens from different sites different levels send them separately in different containers and label those containers like you see in this 
photograph, they have been labeled from H1 to H3, H4, where H1 will probably signify it is from the lateral aspect, superficial aspect, deep aspect, whatever. So send them in different containers. Now uh, this is uh, the picture on your left, top left, shows a map biopsy. Now this is performed in a patient with a sebaceous carcinoma or a squamous cell carcinoma to know which part of the ocular surface is involved. So as you can see, there's a diagram that has been drawn and the tissues are placed based on the site. So this is a very good way of sending a biopsy so that we know what to report, what to, um, how to localize the sample. And you, once we issue a report, you will also get to know which part of the lesion is exactly a malignancy, not a malignancy, how deep it is, how invasive it is. Now in excision biopsies, if you want to indicate the uh, or look um, indicate the uh, laterality use sutures you can use different types of sutures different colors of sutures different lengths of sutures for example in this suture in this specimen there's a short suture which indicates the superior aspect of the lesion there's a long suture which is indicating the lateral aspect of the lesion when we take margins we will then orient the sample sample accordingly and take margins okay now uh, how much preservative do we add? Any idea? The specimen should be completely immersed within the preservative. Okay. That's one way of looking at it. But the ideal uh, amount of formalin is in a ratio of 1 is to 10 to 1 is to 20. So the volume of the specimen to volume of preservative should be 1 is to 10 to 1 is to 20. But if there are large specimens like an exenteration or an eyeball, it may not always be possible to have 1 is to 10 to 1 is to 20 ratio. So 1 is to 2, 1 is to 3 should suffice. But like you said, Subha, yes, the specimen has to be completely immersed in the preservative. Uh, this is another picture which shows orientation of uh, a specimen tissue excise for ocular surface neoplasm. As you can see, the there's a nice diagram over there indicating the side and the tissue is placed over it. Now in specimens with uh, ocular surface squamous neoplasia, it is important that the tissue is placed on a uh, fit filter paper, allow it to dry so and then put it in formalin. Why is it done? Because if you send it directly in formalin, the margins roll over each other, the tissue rolls over and then it becomes difficult to flatten it and orient the margins or sample the margins separately. Alternatively, the picture on your top right, you can send the margins separately or we can sample it from the main tissue. The whole tissue, the whole filter paper is then placed in a polythene bag which contains a preservative. You label the polythene bag and then send it to the lab. Speaking of preservatives, what are the preservatives that are commonly used in day-to-day -day practice? For light microscopy and tests like immunohistochemistry, you use 10% neutral buffered formalin. Now, every word over here or part of this statement is important, 10%. Now, normally, uh, commercial formalin is 40%. If you use 40% formalin, it becomes very concentrated and it gives uh, preserving artifacts. So you have to dilute it to 10%. Then you have to ensure that the formalin is neutral. It shouldn't be acidic or alkaline. And how do you do this? You, you add buffers to it. You add, acid, you add some salts to it and then make it a neutral buffered formula. Bone marrow aspirates can be sent in EDTA or Helis fluid, while a bone marrow biopsy has to be sent in Zenker's fluid. Specimens for electron microscopy have to be sent in glutaraldehyde. Vitreous biopsy, cassette fluid, aqueous humor have to be sent in 90% isopropyl alcohol in a ratio of 1 is to 5. Now, normally, FNACs are performed by pathologists. But let's just say you are in a clinical practice where you don't have a direct access to a lab. And you need to do take a call of doing a patho uh, the FNAC by yourself because you feel it is needed right away or you feel that the patient will find it difficult to come for another visit and you decide to do the FNAC yourself. How do you transport it to the lab? Ideally, you should make two sets of slides. One, you should allow them to air dry so that we can do a GIMSA stain on it. The other set, you should fix it in 95, 90 to 95% isopropyl alcohol. And then we can do some HNE or PAP stain on it. Tissues meant for cell block are placed in Boyne's fluid. So these are the commonly used preservatives. 
Now, how, how, what if the lab is not in your facility or you have an independent setup and you don't have an access to a lab over there? How are you going to transport the specimen? You're not going to take the sample, give it to the relative or the patient and say, you know, just go and give this to the lab. You can't do that. One, because it is infectious. Second, it can spill over. And then, you know, you may, because of the drying or because of the spillage, you may not get an accurate report. So how do you do it? First things first, you need to send uh, fill uh, a non-rigid a, a non rigid leak proof secondary packaging or primary packaging like the kind of plastic container that I showed you in the previous picture. Seal it, then put it in a polythene bag and the entire polythene bag is now put into a cardboard box or a thermocol box. You can put some ice packs also into it to ensure that the temperature remains stable. And then you send it into a then send it to a lab. And in the same way, you can transport it to a lab in another city or another country. That's also fine. Okay, what about samples meant for frozen section? Ideally, you should do a frozen, uh, uh, operate a case that needs frozen section in a facility which has an in-house lab and a frozen section facility. But what if you don't? What if you are in a rural area and you don't have an access? If there is no access to a lab which has a frozen section facility in the vicinity of about 10 kilometers, do not do a frozen section. You need to transport the specimen to the lab maximum 10 minutes. Any further delay, autolysis starts in and the tissue gets degenerated. What if you have to send it to a lab which is close by? Put it, uh, take a gauze piece, soak it in saline, put the specimen into it, cover it with another gauze piece that is soaked in saline, put the entire thing into a um, plastic container or a rigid container and then send it to a lab with a request form. Got it? Okay. Now you have sent the specimen to me. I have analyzed it. What now? Don't start chasing the pathologist for the report. He's going to start taking, he's going to need his own sweet time. And if it is someone like me, he'll say, buzz off, I'm not giving you a report. See, Subhav and Shefali are laughing. They know I do it. Okay. Now, routine samples, which are fixed in formalin, they take about three to four days. Now, if it is a rapid processing, something that, you know, you need an urgent report, an expedited report, or a fro uh, then small if there are small biopsies, like needle core biopsies, very small specimens, vitreous biopsies, uh, ciliary body, choroid biopsies, or even very tiny tissues, then we can issue you a report in 24 to 48 hours. Intraoperative cytology, 10 to 15 minutes. Again, frozen section also, 15 to 20 minutes. Cytology or bone marrow, cytology in the sense FNAC or a bone marrow, it usually takes about 48 to 70, 72 hours, but it can be expedited to 24 hours. Immunohistochemistry usually takes five to seven days because most labs run it on a batch basis. It is not cost effective. Research specimens, they usually take their own, own sweet time. Be pallid to your pathologist. He'll issue your report earlier. Okay. To summarize, have all specimens evaluated. Fix these tissues in 10% neutral buffered formalin. That's the most commonly used preservative. Pack them properly. Transport quickly. Always communicate with the pathologist. Furnish adequate details. And when, once the report is issued, read the report carefully. And in, in, in doubt, always feel free to contact your pathologist. Okay, coming back to triathlon. Taste, taste changer, taste breaker. Okay, now any idea on what happens to your body in, during a triathlon event? Any wild guesses on how much weight is lost? About two kgs of weight is lost when you do when you finish Ironman race. And you burn approximately 10,000 calories. That's how demanding the event is. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run you through some commonly uh, encountered lesions uh, in, in ocular oncology. So let's look at this lady, uh, an elderly lady who presented with this lower eyelid mass, a very fungating uh, cauliflower, you can say cauliflower-like fleshy growth on the palpebral side. The diagnosis is not very difficult to make. 
if you have you know spent an adequate time in the oncology department you know this is a sebaceous carcinoma so how does a sebaceous carcinoma look you know it looks like infiltrative lobular tumor you have center central necrosis and then very typically the cells are clear why they are clear because they contain fat and fat dissolves during processing because in processing we make sure the tissues go through alcohol and alcohol dissolves fat so they appear clear that's not important for you what is important for you is that when the pathologist issues a report what is it that you need to look in the report one the size of the tumor because there are a lot of tumors in which um size of the tumor changes the tnm stage so you need to know the size of the tumor the location of the tumor whether it's come from the glands of zeis meibomian glands wherever the grade of the tumor whether it's moderately differentiated poorly differentiated or well differentiated because well differentiated uh, tumors have a better prognosis than the poorly differentiated ones a factor of prognostic importance is the presence of lymphovascular invasion or perineural tumor spread they are both uh, factors of poor prognosis now status of resected margins you need to know whether the resected margins you, whether you have resected the tumor adequately if the margins are involved you need to go back and revisit your surgery and last but not the least is what is important is the presence of pagetoid spread pagetoid spread is nothing but uh, spread of the tumor into the overlying or any epithelium away from the tumor now spread into the epithelium above the tumor is not so prognostically important but to spread away from the tumor is yes prognostically important now this is a slide which uh, shows pagetoid spread can you see this there's a tumor which is going into the epithelial islands so that's pagetoid spread what happens when your pathologist says that there's a pagetoid spread what do you do you go ahead and do what i have already shown you is a map biopsy where you sample tissues from different parts of the ocular surface and based on this you decide what you're going to do next whether you're going to give chemotherapy or you're going to do surgery or whether you're going to do uh radiotherapy okay now next is this patient who presented with burning redness and this appearance in the eye what is it neoplastic non neoplastic non neoplastic non neoplastic ah mrtika is here okay non neoplastic okay now if you look at the picture in the top right you see that this is a corneal tissue you see the decimates membrane um, at the bottom and there's a neutrophilic infiltrate in the stroma so it clearly tells you that this is an acute inflammation and the slide on your bottom right is a gomorrhea methanum in silver stain and those black elongated processes that you see these ones they are fungal hyphae so this was a case of fungal keratitis now speaking of corneal tissues uh, meant for corneal ulcers or keratitis what uh, what are the stains that we routinely do uh, in the lab one is of course the gms stain that i have already showed you then we do a gram stain so the picture on your top left what is it what are those organisms if i tell you it's a gram stain both are gram stain what are they positive negative the left one is uh, the uh, top left is positive and the yes. bottom right is negative correct so the top one is top gram positive bacilli and That's then in the bottom right you have gram negative bacilli what is this zn lin sun stain yes very good this is zn stain for uh, tuberculosis yes. and you see those bacilli over here what is this this is not the stain that we do for corneal tissues infective ones this is again a zn stain and those reddish pinkish organisms that you see they are zn positive but unlike the zeal nimsen staining staining for tubercul bacilli which is a 20% zn staining this is a 1% zn staining which we use for microsporidia and nocardia so this was a case of microsporidiosis what is this that's a corneal tissue this is a gms stain again because the background is green and those organisms that you see are highlighted in black what do they look like do they look like cysts they are acanthamoeba okay 
Now, another situation where you might need a pathologist in uh, anterior segment practice is such a scenario. What is this? A bowl keratopathy. Sorry? A bowl shaped keratopathy. Okay. What is the likely possibility? Any differential diagnosis? This is a case of dystrophy. Hmm. So you encounter dystrophies, not in every place you would want to send a sample of dystrophy to a pathologist because you already know the diagnosis. But when we receive a tissue for dystrophy, we do three different types of staining. One is a mason strike room staining, wherein the uh, deposited material appears red in color. And when it stains for uh, mason strike room, what is the dystrophy? Granular corneal dystrophy. This is a staining for alchin blue. Now the deposited material is blue in color. And in which dystrophy is alchin blue staining positive? Macular dystrophy, because you see mucopolysaccharides that are deposited in the stroke. And then this, very classical. This is a Congo red staining which shows apple green birefringence and a polarized light. So what dystrophy is this? Lattice corneal dystrophy. Now suppose if you see if you have Mason trichrome positivity and Congo red positivity, both type of deposits, what is the dystrophy? Yes, Ruju? Avalino. Okay. Now, this was a case of an elderly gentleman, uh, let's say 65 years, who presented with this ocular surface mass. What could it be? What is a, what do you think it is? Infective, non infective? Non infective, sir. Okay, non infective. Why do you think this is non infective? Um, you see these feeder vessels? Yes, it is in the interparpical zone. What is it this? It was surface keratin. It yes, is surface keratin. Very good. Staining positive with RB, it has feeder vessels and Correct. it is spread at the limbus. So it is a OSS. OSS. Very good. So this most likely possibility was the ocular surface squamous neoplasm. Uh, like I've already told you, this is how you send a sample of ocular surface squamous neoplasm to your pathologist. Now, OSSN is basically a spectrum. It's not one condition. It's a spectrum, which, re which includes both invasive and non-invasive lesions. The non-invasive lesions vary from mild dysplasia to severe dysplasia based on the thickness of the epithelium that is involved. Then you have the microinvasive squamous cell carcinoma, and then you have the invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Now, in a case of um, OSS or invasive squamous cell carcinoma, it is very important for both the pathologist and the ophthalmologist to pay attention to two, two diagnoses. One is a spindle cell variant, and the other is a mucoepidermoid variant. This is Sir's favorite. Why? Because these variants. A mucoepidermoid variant is not anymore called a mucoepidermoid variant. It is now called what? It's called an adenosquamous carcinoma. Mm -hmm. It's got adenoid and squamous components. So it's an adenosquamous carcinoma. Now, why is it important for a pathologist to diagnose these two separately? Because these two carry a poor prognosis as compared to the conventional squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. Now, this was another patient. Uh, an elderly gentleman who presented with this mass. And then an excentration was done in this patient. Now, this is what a cut surface of an excentration specimen looks like. Now, excentration is basically you remove the part of eyelids, you remove the eyeball, and you remove a part of orbital soft tissue also with it. Now, this white thing that you see, where is it? Okay, this white thing that you see, that's the tumor. This part is the cornea. You have the eyelid over here. Mm -hmm. And you see the tumor is basically involving the limbus, going into the adjacent conjunctiva and then into the orbit. That's why the excentration was performed. And on the gross examination, you see that the um, eyeball is quite intact. There is no infiltration into the intraocular uh, space. Okay. Now, in a case of ocular uh, ocular surface squamous neoplasia, what is it that you need to look into? If it is a biopsy, excision biopsy, there are two important things other than 
what type of lesion it is, whether it's a display, whether it's invasive, non-invasive, whether it's dysplasia, what kind of dysplasia. There are two important things that need to be included in the report. One is status of the margins. And second is the base. These two things have to be there in the report. If you don't see, please send it back to your pathologist and ask, them, ask him to review, him or her to review this. I remember there was this time when I had just joined LV Prasad. And I, it was my second or third day. I issued a report. I was very proud of that report, saying that squamous cell carcinoma, ocular surface. The next day, I got a call. Sir called me. What about the margins? I was like, what margins? <laughs> That's when I got into all the previous reports. And then I realized that these are margins lateral margins basically, which are very important because you need to know whether you need to cry of the patient, you need to go back and excise. So as a pathologist, one needs to include this. Uh, in a patient with in whom exentration has been performed, you know, there are uh, other things other than margins which are important. One is intraocular extension. It is very important for the clinician to know whether the tumor has gone into the eyeball and whether other intraocular structures are involved. So that has to be mentioned. The resected soft tissue and lid margins also need to be informed. So, uh, so they need to be sampled separately while uh, grossing the specimen. So it is a good idea to talk to your pathologist before you send the excentration specimen so that he can sample it accordingly. Okay, some fact about a triathlon again. Uh, there's a, like, you know, they have these uh, events in multiple countries at multiple different times of the year. So it's like different marathon races in different cities. But there's one common event that occurs every year on the same date in Kona, Kona, which is in Hawaii. It's called the Ironman Championship. So people who come in the top three in all the races throughout the year, they, get, they are qualified to participate in these races. So two days before the event, there is something called as an underpant marathon that happens over there. It's a charity event. And it's a tradition to organize this. It's a charity event. So till now, $4 billion have been collected as a part of charity organizing this event. That's how they are serious about this event. Okay. Oh, nothing Greek and Latin over here. This is again common in ocular oncology practice. Child presenting with leucoria. Classical white reflex. Calcification, calcified mass in the eye. Retinoblastoma. So in a patient with group E eyes, you know, usually the eyeball comes to me. Not anymore. Earlier, there used to be a lot of primary enucleations. Now they are treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And then if required, the eyes are sent to me. So the work volumes have shifted from primary enucleations to secondary enucleations. Nonetheless, the eyeball is sent. So this is how an eyeball looks like when it is sent to me. And like Subha suggested, uh, when sending an eyeball, always ensure that the whole eyeball is immersed in formal. Okay, now question for you all. When a pathologist is crossing an eyeball, which is the first part that he cuts across? Raju, you have crossed it. Yes, sir. so the first... The specimen uh, is trans illuminated and uh, as per the tumor location, uh, the specimen uh, further grossing is done. Very good. Yes. So it is trans illuminated first, but before cutting the eyeball, it is very important to sample the resected end of optic nerve. What happens is when you open the eyeball, it is likely that the tumor is friable and the tumor can spill, spill over. And then, you know, it can cling to the outer surface or it can cling to the optic nerve and give a false effect of a spread. So it is important to cut the resected end of optic nerve even before you get into sampling the eyeball. So this is how a resected end of optic nerve is sampled. Usually the last three to four millimeters are sampled. And like you said, then we perform a trans elimination test to locate the tumor. And then a pupil or optic section is taken based on the location of the tumor. Now, when a pupil or optic section is taken, the first part or the first sample that you get is a 
central canal, which includes the optic nerve. And this is how a retinoblastoma will, will look like from inside, classically called as a fish flesh appearance. Okay. Now, this is how it looks under the microscope, very blue, because it is made up of round cells and it originates from the retina. So, you see over here, it's originating from the, this is the normal retina and you see this is evolving into a tumor. Okay. Very classical of retinoblastoma. This is how a pathologist makes a diagnosis of retinoblastoma. What is it? What do you see over here? Can you see the structures? This, this, this. Very... Rosettes. Floral structures. These are rosettes. Okay? Rosettes. Now, there are two different types of rosettes that you see in retinoblastoma, flexaventastinar and homer, homeride rosettes. One which have a lumen in it. You see this? This has a lumen in it. While you can look at this, this doesn't have a lumen in it. So, flexaventastinar and homeride. Other than this, you can also have perivascular pseudorosettes, but they are pseudorosettes. They are not true rosettes. Okay, now you send the eyeball to your pathologist and the pathologist says, you know, this is a retinoblastoma, writes on the re report, it's a retinoblastoma, sends it back to you. What will you do? Send back. If this is Dr. Santosh and this is me, he'll kick me. And send back the report. He'll say pack your bags. Okay, so... A pathologist's job is not to diagnose a retinoblastoma. You as a clinician already know it's a retinoblastoma. What is important for the pathologist is to tell whether there are high risk factors, which are called histopathological high risk factors. Now, what are those histopathologic high risk factors? One is massive choroidal invasion. So when I say massive, it is understood there is something called minimal or focal. So anything that is more than three millimeters in any dimension, whether horizontal, transverse or if it is full thickness choroidal invasion, then it is called as a massive choroidal invasion. Then you have the retrolaminar optic nerve invasion, which again tells you that invasion into the head or into the lamina cribrosa is not a high risk factor by itself. Only when it goes beyond the lamina cribrosa into the retrolaminar optic nerve, then it becomes a histopathologic high risk factor. Then you have extraocular tumor spread. So if tumor goes beyond the sclera into the periocular soft tissue, it's extraocular tumor spread. And that's a high risk factor. Involvement of any tissue of the anterior segment becomes a high risk factor. Scleral involvement, again a high risk factor. We'll get into the details of this, but for now, just remember this. Now let's look at this picture. What do you see? Anterior chamber. You see this? Yeah. There's a tumor over here. Okay. What part of the eye is this? Anterior tumor. tumor. Okay. This is the cut surface. When the specimen came to me, that is the cut surface. What is this? Lens. Okay, let's start over here. What part of eyeball is this? Cornea. That's a cornea. Very good. Behind this is the anterior chamber. And then you have the iris. So this becomes the lens. Next to this, what is this? That's a ciliary body. So tumor getting into the ciliary body over here. And that's how it looked under the microscope. So these things, processes that you see are ciliary processes. And you have the tumor here involving the angle, the iris, the anterior chamber, and even clinging to the posterior surface of the cornea. So the entire anterior segment is involved by the tumor. So that becomes your high risk factor. And let's look at this eyeball. What do you see? You see, these are vitreous seeds. That's the tumor. And if you see very carefully, this tumor is going into the choroid. Mm -hmm. See this? That's the vitreous space. You see the RPE over here. That's the choroid. You have the choroidal vessels over here. So that's a full thickness choroidal invasion. That becomes your high risk factor. And this is going to be more than three millimeters in dimension, which also again makes it a massive choroidal invasion. What about this? See this? What part of the optic nerve? Yes, that's the optic nerve. You can see a very swollen optic nerve, thickened optic nerve, which can give you an idea that probably the optic, optic nerve is involved. 
Now look at this cut surface of the eyeball. You see this tumor involving the optic nerve head and almost getting inside. You know, the, the disc is involved. Now let's look at this. So when you say lamina cribrosa, what is lamina cribrosa? Now this part is the optic nerve. Now this is the sclera. Now if you arbitrarily join two ends of the sclera, Okay, if you join two ends of the sclera, that's where your lamina cribrosa lies. So if you see the tumor over here is not getting into the lamina cribrosa, it's only involving the optic nerve head. So that isn't your high risk factor. But if you look into this, it's going through the lamina cribrosa into the retrolaminar optic nerve. So it becomes your high risk factor. All this blue thing over here, that's your tumor. Okay, now this is how the resected end of optic nerve looks. Now, all this blue thing that you see over here is the tumor. The tumor is in involving the parenchyma of the optic nerve resected margin. What about this? The parenchyma is free, but the bluish tumor is seen around the resected end. So it's involving the meninges. Involvement of meninges of the resected end is again a high risk factor. This will make it at stage what? T4. Involvement of resected end will make it T4. Now, this is the tumor getting inside the sclera. Now, if your pathologist tells you that the tumor is involving the sclera, sclera, always go back to him and ask him what part of the sclera is involved, whether it's involving the inner half or the outer half. And here you see tumor on both sides of the sclera. So this is extraocular tumor spread. This again makes it a high risk factor. What about this? How is this different from the earlier retinoblastomas that we have seen. If you look at this, it's more yellowish than whitish. And then you see this brownish, whitish spots in it. What do this signify? Okay. See this? This is a fish flesh appearance. This one also. But here, the tumor is more yellowish. So these are calcified areas. This is probably, not probably, definitely a tumor which has been uh, this is secondary enucleation. The patient was administered chemotherapy. So, so it's a treated eye. And that's how the retinoblastoma looks in secondary specimens. It's all calcified. So what is a pathologist expected to report in secondary enucleations? One, whether there's a viable tumor. If yes, how much percentage of it is viable? If it is not viable, is it necrotic? Is it calcified? If it is viable or calcified, what part of the eyeball or intraocular structures are involved. You know, sometimes what happens is the MRI shows that there are, there are high risk factors. But when the eyeball comes to us, there is nothing. Neither, the, neither of the intraocular structures are involved. So this is very typical and this is called downstaging of the tumor. Chemotherapy downstages the tumor and we don't see anything. Sometimes only calcified masses are seen. So again, that is prognostically important. For your further management. Okay, now we have come to the last part. This is very one more common tumor that you would come across in a day to day practice. Let's just say this is a middle aged uh, lady who presented with dimension of vision over the past three to six months. Uh, what does the picture on your right show? It's a B scan. Yeah. Stickly solid tumor, which yes. is probably arising from the choroid. Correct. With a scan overlay showing medium uh, reflectivity. So Correct. My first differential would be choroidal melanoma. Correct. So this is a choroidal mass and um, adult primary choroidal mass. The commonest one is melanoma. Speaking of which, which is the commonest intraocular tumor in adult? Fuchs adenoma. Really? Okay, let me reframe my question. Which is the commonest malignant tumor in adults? I think uh, secondaries. Like yes, yes, metastasis. Okay, now again, like Ruju had mentioned, we first do a transillumination, and this is a classic transillumination showing this pigmented tumor in the eyeball. Okay. Now, when I cut the eyeball, this is how the tumor looked like. A classical mushroom-shaped appearance, endophytic, 
going inside inwards into the vitreous now why is it mushroom shaped any idea it's a breakthrough from the brooks membrane yes it the tumor gets through the brook brooks membrane and then expands that's why it has got a um, mushroom shape now the pigmented appearance is a giveaway unless you know it's a hemorrhage or it's a infarcted tumor infarcted mass melanomas typically appear pigmented and blackish in color now in a case of melanoma what do you look for in a report now the list is extensive but this is what you need to look location whether it's in the iris whether it's a ciliary body or choroid because that's how your stage is going to change then the size of the tumor the basal diameter and the height are very important then coming to the microscopic details earlier they used to be classified into three different type three uh, four different types now there are only three different types one is spindle cell one is epithelioid and there is a mixed spindle cell and epithelioid type the commonest is a mixed tumor and based on which the melanomas are graded as 1 2 and 3 then it is important to mention the mitotic activity these are all factors of pathological prognostic importance then presence of absence of necrosis vascular invasion presence of infiltrating lymphocytes scleral involvement like in a retinoblastoma how much part of sclera is involved whether it's the inner half outer half whether there is optic nerve involvement whether there is extraocular tumor spread resected margin status if it is involving the optic nerve and then we don't perform this in most institutes but it is very typically performed in uh, western countries chromosomal abnormalities there are certain chromosomal abnormalities which are typically associated with um, melanoma and some carry poor prognosis any idea which of these are prognostically important or carry poor prognosis yes which which okay chromosome tell me which chromosome and yes chromosome 3 and 8 very good okay before i finish triathlon is a demanding sport but it is not difficult you know every year hundreds of specially challenged athletes compete and finish ironman events i had an opportunity of racing with you know one such athlete and in 2020 this is a picture of this person called nick chris chris nevik nevik chris nevik that's his name he is the first triathlete with down syndrome to complete a ironman event so you know this generation thrives on the fact that you know work harder party harder but you know i will say work hard exercise harder that's what is going to take you long so I think we are done for today. If there are any questions, please shoot across. How many donuts did you eat at the end of your triathlon? <laughs> oh, a lot of them, lot of them, <laughs> really a lot, lot of donuts, lot of pastas. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for that uh, amazingly comprehensive lecture. I know pathology uh, for everyone is actually tough because we don't get to see so many slides and. um we don't read so much about it but uh, you made it simple and hopefully our postgraduate students and also the fellows actually would have gained a lot from it and we are looking forward to your second class thank you shefali uh, yeah and thank you subha ruju mitika no no we have still questions to shoot to you <laughs> okay oh you still have questions okay fine shoot yeah. yes. so yeah subha go ahead so uh, one of the viewers has asked what all precautions do we take uh, while transferring a biopsy sample to a pathologist transferring is, uh, can you can you come again yes sir what all precautions are taken while transporting a tissue to a uh, pathologist yes sir. okay uh, let's start from the basics one please ensure that the preservative is in the right quantity second the packaging has to be optimal it should be a rigid non breakable leak proof container third transport quickly fourth fill the form properly 
and always handle the specimens in a careful manner because they can be infected and if the and if you know about any prior infections or health hazards associated please communicate it to the lab person uh, the second question is in which cases is an immunohistochemistry a must uh well uh, there are cert immunohistochemistry is basically done to identify the type of tumor so um it goes without saying that it is practiced mostly in oncology cases um now in which cases is it important the, now tumors are usually well differentiated moderately differentiated or poorly differentiated if the tumors are well differentiated one usually doesn't need um immunohistochemistry because the morphology is very clear to make a diagnosis but then there are when the, but then in some situations you would need immunohistochemistry to prognosticate the tumor like you do a chi67 so the chi67 proliferation would tell you how how much a malignant uh, how much of a proliferative potential the tumor has now for diagnosis immunohistochemistry is important in poorly differentiated tumors to type whether let's just say you find a spindle cell neoplasm in the orbit so you want to know the origin of the tumor whether it's a nerve sheet tumor whether it's a um, um <clears throat> myofibroblastic tumor whether it's a lipomatous tumor so these are situations where one needs immunohistochemistry so this is always uh, this always comes to light only when we do a light microscopic examination before that it is difficult for a pathologist to say which tumor needs but most cases of lymphomas immunohistochemistry is needed yes sir so uh, the third question is special stains which are used in ocular oncology specimens okay um the commonest ones are zn stain like you said to uh, rule out tuberculosis gms and ps stain gomuris methanamin silver and periodic acid skip stain to uh, identify fungi congrate stain to uh, identify amyloid <clears throat> then um gram stain for any bacterial infections yeah so these are the commonest ones and of course we also do uh, i wouldn't call it a special stain but it's a special technique which is called a per permanganate breach uh suppose if we have a pigmented tumor brownish pigmented tumor which uh which are the tumors which are the pigments that are brown in color melanin one is melanin melanin yeah okay second is hemosiderin hmm. and third is lipofuscin of course lipofuscin is a little golden brown but still brown so how do i know if it is melanin or hemosiderin so one we can do a pearl stain to identify iron the other way you i can also do a permanganate bleach which bleaches melanin pigment but it will not bleach uh, iron so this is the other special stain that we use other than that i don't recollect any other ones which are used on a day to day basis so the importance of uh, having a multi level incision biopsy specimen being examined and its uh, importance in terms of diagnosis shefali <laughs> that's a question for you <laughs> you are an expert now <laughs> i think shefal you can answer this yeah so basically we know that uh, the pathology of the tumors can be variable especially like a uh, sample like if you are suspecting lymphoma it can at one place it can be benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia it can be like it's a spectrum so it's very important that we take sample from a representative area of the tumor so ideally we should actually do an imaging and uh, specify the epicenter of the uh, lesion like radiologically and go beyond the epicenter so that we actually take the superficial intermediate level and deeper level of biopsy because if we just take superficial level it might be so that we are just taking a non representative sample which might be misleading it can give a misdiagnosis it can actually delay the diagnosis we might have to repeat the sample uh, sampling so it is in any ways a financial burden for the patient long wait for the treatment to start so all of those problems so it's better that at one sitting we should take samples at different levels so that we have a representative sample and uh, we give the right diagnosis correct very true
like especially and like how we have a very aggressive tumor so the deeper sample in fact might be just necrotic because it's like it's outgrowing its blood supply so intermediate sample might just give us a diagnosis and superficial might just be fibrosis or inflammation so that's why the importance of multi level yeah sometimes um, we um uh, shefali if you remember we have also seen that there are some cases where the superficial or the middle biopsies fail to show an organism but the deeper one showed an organism so we have had this case of fungal granuloma where we couldn't see fungal elements in the superficial tissues so mm-hmm. good to have a multi level incision biopsy yeah and uh, sir i have a question from that uh, because it it has been asked to me when i was presenting this uh, okay. when we use cryotherapy to sample the specimen does it destroy the sample many people actually ask me this question if like we cryo assisted bi- biopsy if we do well from what i have seen what uh, santosh sir does i have never seen his tissues getting spoiled never irrespective of whether he has used cryo or he has used uh, cotton i have never seen his tissue getting damaged but i have seen tissues being damaged from elsewhere so i think it ultimately boils down to the surgeon okay but the you procedure the cryo will not, will not from... damage okay like using a cryotherapy like uh, the freeze and thaw will not yes, damage it the... usually yes. doesn't damage usually it doesn't damage is it because it's like a very quick one like we Correct. are just the time the time applied i think determines and maybe you know the pressure the temperature i think they all determine how much whether the tissue is damaged or it isn't so i have a question uh, yeah. when we do a frozen uh, section and we report the margins what is the percentage when that can be a uh, like a misleading uh, diagnosis and in a fixed section we get a margin involvement okay a uh, very good question see frozen section because of the time limitation the section taken it's it's a single section whereas when you do a routine processing and we uh, do a routine uh, interpretation we take multiple sections mm. so the probability of missing a positive a positive uh, or missing a tumor is always there mm. because again there's a bias bias sampling bias so but mostly you know i have encountered i mean i have myself come across cases a couple of them you know in this say 10 year span where it has happened that the subsequent sections have showed positivity but the frozen section did not so basically we should always look at the margin in the fixed section also if yes. it have a negative frozen yes any further questions So, uh yes yes uh specific uh, features of a leiomyoma on pathology ah so basically it's a spindle cell neoplasm um now most spindle cell neoplasms have a very overlapping histology in the fact that you know they are all spindle shaped but if you want me to talk about leiomyoma leiomyoma they have a slightly fibrillary cytoplasm slightly fibrillary and they have what we call as nuclei which look cigar shaped that is rounded ends elongated whereas if you compare them with nerve sheet tumors the nuclei are wavy with pointed edges so nothing very classical about leiomyoma it's it's a very common overlapping histology that's why when you get a case of leiomyoma immunohistochemistry is always warranted mm-hmm. it's not a light microscopic diagnosis thank you sir that's all the questions we have for tonight okay thank you Over everyone to make yeah. the announcement yes thank you so much sir for being with us here and we look forward to friday because yes. i think you have something interesting yeah, we'll discuss some interesting us. cases yes. <laughs> so we'll next meet on friday which is 9th uh, and it will be the part 2 of sir's lecture so see you all okay thank you